Welcome to this afternoon's Federalist Society virtual event. Today, May 4th, we discuss artificial intelligence and bias. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's panel. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by a very distinguished panel. I will introduce our moderator first, followed by our speakers. Our moderator today is Mr. Kurt Levy, President of the Committee for Justice, an organization organization devoted to advancing constitutionally limited government and individual liberty. He serves on the Federalist Society Civil Rights Practice Group, and prior to law school, he was involved in an AI startup. Mr. Stuart Baker is a partner at the law firm of Steptoe & Johnson in Washington, D.C. He has been general counsel of the National Security Agency, and he's the host of the Cyber Law Podcast, which is now in its 360th episode. Nicholas Weaver is an International and Computer Science Institute and lecturer at UC Berkeley. His primary research focuses on network security, notably worms, botnets, and other internet scale attacks and network measurement. He now spends a fair amount of time translating technical issues into understandable material for policymakers. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. So be thinking of those as we go along and have them in mind for when we get to that portion of the event. If you would like to ask a question, please submit those questions via chat and our moderator will read them out and hand those over to our speakers. With that, thank you for being with us today. Uh, Mr. Levy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, this is a subject of, of great interest to me given, our, given my uh, career, which has involved both law, including discrimination and uh, and being in the AI field, and I'm, I'm clearly not alone in, in this being of great interest because uh, most discussions about AI these days are, um, you know, uh, mention the uh, potential for AI bias against racial minorities and other um, identity groups. And, uh, you know, just a few of the many areas where bias can creep in is facial recognition, lending, uh, bail determinations. Um, I'd like um, our panelists to discuss whether uh, potential AI bias is indeed the grave problem you would think from the debate, or is it uh, exaggerated uh, or misunderstood? And, um, you know, and then also answer the related question of, you know, AI, despite its flaws, is it an improvement over human decision-making, which has been known to uh, have an irrational bias or two. Um, AI models may not have traditional prejudices, but they learn by discovering patterns in real world data, and they may discover correlations that you know, have a disparate impact on, on one group or another. Um, in any case, uh, legislation is being proposed at the state and federal level um, and even enacted uh, to address these concerns. I've, I've heard the Biden administration is working on agency regulations on AI and bias. So I'd also like our panelists to discuss the extent to which we need new laws beyond uh, uh, current you know, uh, discrimination laws that already give human decision makers, as well as the tools they uh, use that already govern um, people basically. Um, so without further ado, um, uh, Nick, can you start us off? Yeah, and I will start off with basically a discussion of what people call AI today. And it's really a process known as machine learning. And this is actually a very old thought. People have been looking at machine learning since the 90s, if not earlier. Um, it's just that in the past uh, few years, we've had a revolution in the capability of machine learning, not because the underlying algorithms have gotten better, but because of a quirk of happenstance. And that is that the underlying problem behind machine learning, what we call dense matrix multiply, take a whole bunch of numbers, multiply them together to get a whole bunch of numbers, is something that works really well on graphics cards for some strange reason. Well, not strange reason, but a coincidental reason. Um, and so as a consequence, we've had a revolutionary leap in the amount of compute we can throw at the problem. And so how machine learning works is you have a whole bunch of data. This data has patterns, but you don't know what the patterns are 
and don't know the meaning of the patterns. So you create a whole bunch of labeled data. So let's take an example of, I wanna do dogs and wolves. I take a whole bunch of photos of dogs, whole bunch of photos of wolves, download them off the internet, and basically split them out into a set of training data that uh, is munged on in an attempt to find the pat underlying pattern. And then I verify it by taking some of the data I didn't use and I test it and golly gee, my photo recognizer is quite good at telling dogs from wolves because it picked up on the trees and snow and the wolf photos, not something innately wolfness. Um, and in fact, when you dig into more details, you see that the, for some reason, the sled dog photos tend to get misclassified more than the um, other photos. And so here we get into the two big problems of machine learning. One, what are the biases in the training set? And two, how do you know what the machine learner actually distinguished on? Because when you can come up with a distinguisher that you can explain, you don't actually end up needing the machine learning anymore except to hunt for the distinguisher. So for the dogs and wolves example, um, it's quite subtle. For uh, wolf-like dogs, what you have to do is look at the eyebrows. Uh, wolves are a bit bigger. Wolves do not have expressive eyebrows. Um, but it's actually a really hard problem to distinguish dogs from wolf-like dogs because they're so genetically similar, they'll actually interbreed. So the question is, is machine learning the right answer in the first place versus just uh, nailing them and do a DNA test? Um, so that's problem, those are the problems. We don't know what goes into the training set um, and we don't know what patterns we are getting. And then it gets used by companies that want it as a black box. So they um, view the training data as a competitive advantage. Um, they view the deniability as a competitive advantage. So like, Facebook uh, uses a whole bunch of machine learning in their ad profiling of people. And it's not their fault that uh, alcohol ads get presented to those under 21. Um, it's not like Facebook knows their birth dates. Um, it's just coincidental. And so we have that go on as well. And it's easy to misuse. So every couple of years, we get a paper recapitulating phrenology. So for the trivia buffs, that's the notion that the bumps on your head somehow indicate uh, aspects about you. Um, the only thing that phrenology really indicates is that the people involved need retrophrenology, which is you beat them over the head until they uh, understand what they're doing is wrong. But the classic way of doing it is you take a bunch of photos of criminals and a bunch of photos of non-criminals and you come up with a distinguisher between the two. Um, but how do you get the photos? How do you know that you aren't putting bias into the data set? So for example, one thing that you get is um, it's clear that our policing has biases in it. And so any data that captures the results of policing decisions is going to have that bias built into it, um, unless you're very, very careful. And even when you're done, the question is, what are you distinguishing on? And this keeps cropping up over and over again. So like every time Silicon Valley does a face recognizer, it seems to be vastly worse on African-American faces and they are unable to answer the question, is it that um, your training data is not as good or could it be fundamentally harder because things like freckles and skin moles have a lower contrast. And so unless your camera's good, you don't see those. And they have no way of answering the question of why, but you start to think it's biases in training set when um, Asian faces seem to do vastly better 
on Chinese built image recognition systems than they do on US built image recognition systems. And these creep in all the time. But in terms of legislation, I'm not sure if uh, legislation is necessary beyond having systems be able to explain what their decision making is, because then you know if there's uh, bias involved or not. I guess we should uh, hand it over to Stuart at this point. Okay, <clears throat> uh, that was that was very interesting, and I I do want to pick up on a, a a few things, and I'll start with explainability, which the AI experts tell us is a real problem. I uh, that it's hard to get to AI to explain itself, uh, and that is certainly uh, the experience of most people in the field. Uh, but. Um, what we do when we don't get an explanation in this area uh, is we kind of anthropomorphize the AI. Uh, in fact, I would say we misanthropomorphize the AI, if that's a word. We, we, we assume the worst about the, the intentions of artificial intelligence, which we have imbued with a kind of personality. Um, and so there is a tendency, it's either a natural human tendency, or it's a liberal bias on the part of the investigators and the journalists that cover the, uh, the research to say, if there is any adverse impact on any of the uh, minority groups that I care about, uh, then I'm going to attribute that to racism, sexism, transphobia, whatever, um, on the part of this uh, anthropomorphized uh, 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 engine. Um, and th that strikes me as the first problem in making policy in this area, is that there is an enthusiasm for finding bias that is uh, vastly exceeds the amount of bias that it's fair to identify. And I think, uh, Kurt talked a little bit about uh, whether there's uh, uh, bias in uh, uh, determinations about uh, sentences and parole. And that's a pretty good example. Everybody's heard this who studies in the field that uh, uh, Broward County was using a racist uh, uh, mechanism for determining uh, uh, who was going to be a recidivist. And it turns out that you can say that, you could say that about any use of the AI that um, uh, Broward County had engaged in. They had a, uh, an algorithm that was equally predictive as to white and black inmates. It was almost exactly the same mistake. So ProPublica went down there and said, well, let's take a look at after the decision is made, when we can see whether they actually were recidivists and see what kind of error rate there was. And they discovered that there were a lot more errors that kept people in jail if they were black and a lot more errors that let people go if they were white. And they said, obviously, this is racist. And then we all believe it from, from the, the, uh, the press coverage. But the folks that looked at this and said, well, why don't we try to fix that soon realized you can't fix that without wrecking the fairness in the predictive quality of the AI. It's just mathematically not possible in a context where recidivism rates are different between blacks and whites uh, to have fairness both in the forward-looking prediction and in the backward-looking uh, determination of whether things were done properly, predictions were right or wrong. Uh, and so it was, you know, uh, heads uh, ProPublica wins, tails compass loses. Uh, uh, they could always find bias. And I think we need to be careful with all of these studies to ask, were there alternative um, uh, calculations or uh, explanations uh, to the immediate assumption of bias, which 
in especially academia is always the first resort of the researchers. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Nick's quite right about uh, face recognition. There's a perfectly, you know, face recognition is less good on dark faces, less good on female faces, less good on young faces. And when you think about it, if you believe that face recognition is mostly looking for bone structure, uh, if there's less contrast because the shadows are harder to see on dark faces than white faces, if it's harder to see the bones because there's more subcutaneous fat on young faces or female faces than old male faces, you're going to have a much easier time finding the, the bone structure of old pale men uh, to my uh, horror. I think I find that every morning when I shave. Um, a, and so that's, a, that's an understandable explanation. No one has really spent a lot of time asking that because it's, it serves ideological purposes to say, oh, well, it's because of racism in the design or the training of the, uh, uh, the, the, the algorithm. So I worry that we can quickly get to an accusation of a bias that is not grounded in any serious uh, uh, consideration of alternatives, and that that drives us down a cliff that we will really regret because the, the next step is to say, well, then we need to demand fairness of every algorithm. Uh, and the researchers have been quite candid in this area of saying, well, sure, we can give you fairness. We can give you 20 different kinds of fairness. You just tell us which fairness you want. You want to have all groups that uh, uh, you care about uh, not disadvantaged by this. We can set it up. Uh, we can just shim the data, rig the data so that it does it, it refuses to find distinctions among those groups. Or if you want to find pure accuracy and don't care and you think that's the fairest uh, uh, outcome, we can uh, solve for uh, accuracy or we can solve for individual fairness uh, uh, of the sort that Martin Luther King said, I have a dream speech called for uh, uh, content of character and not uh, color of skin. Uh, uh, but if you leave the question of what is fairness up to the designers of the algorithm and the people who are on the front lines of most of the decision-making here, the Office of Civil Rights at the Justice Department, especially in a democratic administration, you're gonna get group rights. You're gonna get a determination that every group should be protected against disparate impact and not just every group, but every intersection of groups. Uh, and uh, that requires a lot of shimming of the data to achieve. But once you've achieved it, and, and uh, people are doing that now much more often with synthetic data, they're just making up data for and there's a lot of good reasons to make up data. But uh, uh, if you make up the data or if you run a, uh, a machine learning uh, system in which you say to the machine, go through and tell me what percentage of each group uh, you've promoted as um, relevant and, and uh, uh, treated as, as a positive. Uh, and if you produce a result that is not within 10 or 20 per points of being um, proportionate to whatever representation we're going to put in front of the uh, machine, we will reject it. We'll tell the machine it got it wrong until it learns it's sort of like a um, uh, an admissions officer at Harvard or uh, uh, somebody operating under a consent decree that sets goals but not quotas. That you know um, there are right answers and there are wrong answers, and you might not want to talk exactly about how you got to the right answer, but you by God will get to the right answer. And uh, uh, you're essentially building a set of quotas into every definition of fairness you apply. And that takes me to the last point, which is that we have used quotas like nitroglycerin in policy making. It's very, very strong medicine. And it has the capability of being enormously socially divisive as witness Harvard admissions. Uh, and so 
having all of those um, quota systems built into every decision that is touched by AI is a dramatic expansion of how um, uh, we understand decisions to be made. Uh, and I think in the long run, imposes a kind of AI fairness tax uh, because it says no matter what the reasons for the statistical disparity that you encounter may be, you know, there may be a dozen environmental factors that you can tra trace back if you choose to systemic racism, but are nonetheless very real and had a very real impact on these individuals. You have to ignore all of that in the interest of producing a proportional representation of whatever group has been chosen uh, uh, for this uh, in the reward that is being handed out. It almost becomes a kind of weird reparations program uh, in which all of those past problems are imposed as something that has to be solved by whoever is using the AI for this particular decision very likely to produce uh, disparities that we don't like. And maybe more uh, important, and this is my last point, it buries the debate deep in the mysteries of artificial intelligence. The people making the decision, and, and, and Nick said this about uh, uh, some of the advertising decisions, the people making the decisions can say, I just want to use artificial intelligence, but of course I want it to be fair. And then they say to the people uh, giving them the algorithm, is it fair? And they say, yes, we, we took it to experts um, who uh, come from academia and are determined to root out the, uh, uh, the unfairness. And so this is a fair algorithm. Don't ask any more questions. And of course the decision maker is happy to get the results that they get. So they don't ask any questions. Nobody knows how much or how little discrimination actually ended up in the algorithm because it's hidden behind a veil of unexplainability. And I, I, I just think that's the wrong direction for us to go. And from a legislative point of view, we probably should stop talking about fairness and start saying, we need to know every time you rig these, these uh, results, tweak these results, use synthetic uh, data for these results, uh, in order to achieve some definition of fairness, and we want to know exactly what your definition of fairness is. Thank you, Stuart. I'll uh, throw a few questions at uh, at you and Nick, and uh, and then we'll turn to audience questions. Um, let me direct this first one at at Nick. Um, what do you say about Stuart's point, which is that um, let's say you pick good data that accurately reflects the world and you carefully pick your variables um, and you minimize error or put it another way, you maximize the accuracy of the system and still uh, the system is, is recommending more negative bail determinations for black people than for white people. Do you just accept that um, after, you know, after carefully studying it to make sure that there, you know, it wasn't bad data or bad, bad variables? Or do you need to um, to fix it, despite the fact that that would increase the um, error made by the system? Well, it depends. Are we having single-sided error or are errors for one group different from another? Um, what is the underlying rationale for the decision-making? And this gets back to the explainability problem um, that the algorithm designers aren't really designing algorithms. They're curating training data into a black box that is designed to give them a answer that they cannot come up with a rationale for otherwise. Because if they can, they don't need the machine learning. Um, and so that's the fundamental problem is people are using this in a way that um, is deliberately obscuring the problems. And then other people go along and go, hey, you have a problem. And then we get uh, Stuart freaking out about, uh, about the woke mob when um, he just made a very convincing argument that uh, because there is underlying disparity in the underlying real world data, 
what do we do about that? So, um, Stuart, I never thought you'd be quite so progressive. <laughs> um, I'll try to overcome it. <laughs> and the other problem is, is there is enough evidence out there that there is a tendency to like that machine learning can launder stuff and can find uh, confounding variables very easily. So say your training data explicitly excludes race, but includes zip code of residence. That's going to be a very strong proxy. If it also includes name as well as zip code of residence, that is going to be a really strong proxy. And the machine learner is going to instantly figure out the um, proxies for the thing you don't want to officially select on and select on that. Um, yes, but it's not going to do it out of malevolence. It's going to do it out of the fact that, again, those quote proxies allow it to minimize error. So let me and, ask you just let me let me ask you this question. Um, nobody's saying that AI systems are perfect, but um, you know humans are not perfect either. Um, humans do have malevolent biases and sometimes intend to discriminate, um, and they often know your race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, whereas you can hide that from a machine. So let me ask you both to do sort of a comparative analysis. Um, assuming flaws in the AI uh, systems, are they still better bias-wise than us deeply flawed humans? It depends. I know you hate that answer, but <laughs> it really depends on the context of the system and who's making the decision and whether the decision makers themselves are aware of their own biases, that that actually makes a difference. That if, uh, if people are aware of their unconscious biases, the biases become less. Um, so Stuart, yeah, I, 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 yeah my, my sense is, yes, this is powerful technology for finding uh, weak variables and maybe a lot of them. And those weak variables, when combined, uh, are likely to add to the accuracy of the decision. Uh, and that's something, you know, what we do as human beings is if we have four variables in mind uh, when we make a decision about how good somebody is at a particular thing, uh, we're probably at the limits of our analysis. Uh, I, and it's very easy all the talk about unconscious bias builds off of the idea that we take shortcuts and sometimes race or uh, ethnicity or uh, uh, gender is a pretty good shortcut for determining uh, uh, you know uh, people's uh, ability in the long jump or it turns out that when you actually study the effect the that uh, bias turns out to be wrong so if you look at studies of corporate leadership, uh, women are actually better at that. And so um, the biases that have caused men to get promoted over women in those circumstances has often been self-defeating, but until you really get at it, how do you know? And, and only only AI, well, not only AI, but AI is a way of finding that in contexts where you can determine um, with some specificity, what is success and what is failure, uh, and uh, compare it to a very large data set. So I'd say, you know, AI probably deserves the benefit of the doubt over uh, uh, the human guesses. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean it's perfect. It's uh, it's got the wolf problem for sure, uh, and uh, uh, I think we we always need to worry about that. But when somebody comes to bring you an a bias story, they they need something other than just to say, oh, well, there's probably bias here in the decisions that uh, were arrived at by the um, uh, the people in the training data. Uh, I, I think that's a cop out. Let me um, let me throw sort of a similar question at you uh, on, on explanation. Uh, that's long been recognized as sort of a weakness in AI systems is their ability to explain their reasons. It goes back, well, certainly for as long as I've 
been involved in the field. And um, um, but again, you know, humans have the limitations there, too. They rely a lot on intuition. In and sometimes um, they're not truthful about why they made a particular decision. So I'll ask you again both to compare and contrast the relative weaknesses and strengths of AI versus humans. Um, I think that human decision makers are far better at explaining their rationale. Now, some of it may be self-justifying. Some of it, we have the self-justification problem. We have the problem of of basically people laundering their biases in justification, et cetera. But at least they can try. Um, that the biggest problem I have with applying AI to people is that it can't show its work. It literally cannot. It is an open research problem to get the AI to show its work. And if you can get it to show its work, it doesn't need to be AI. So I'm not sure that that's, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to uh, challenge Nick on the technology, but from the point of view of um, explainability, there are things that you, one can easily imagine techniques for extracting what were the significant factors and trying to uh, give uh, weights to those, varying the data inputs in ways that tell you what uh, those variations meant in terms of outcomes that might give you a pretty good idea of what's happening inside the AI. And I do think that if you can do that, you're likely to discover something. You're likely to discover, I don't know, that left-handed people have an affinity for certain kinds of mechanical work that no one imagined because it, it, it was too mild a variable to uh, um, to become a stereotype, right? and and so I think explainability may allow us to to, to take AI insights and actually use them, and we wouldn't have those insights without the AI having done the analysis. Thank you. Um, let me ask you another question. Um, the very purpose of decision-making models, AI or otherwise, is to discriminate. Exam, you know, for example, discriminate uh, between people who are good and bad uh, credit risks if you're building a lending model. So, how do we tell the difference between useful discrimination and and bad discrimination? I mean, sometimes it's easy. I think we would all um, agree a rational uh, racial bias is wrong, but but sometimes it's it's not so clear cut. I mean, what if it discriminates based on the neighborhood you live in? So how do we determine what's okay and what's not? So this is a hard problem okay. wherever that whatever the decision maker is, um, that's a hard problem and that's a greater societal problem. Um, so poor neighborhoods are worse credit. Poor neighborhoods have a long racial history behind them are you justified in using zip code to make decisions on home lending? And the answer is no, not directly, because this was used for explicit discriminatory purposes in the past. Um, I, thus the anti-redlining laws. I, I think that's, that's a good kind of summary of how we have approached these issues in the past, but may not be if we're, if we're going down the path we're going with AI. That is to say, the presumption has been uh, that using certain categories, race, ethnicity, gender, is just not right. You should not use those as shorthand for people's capabilities uh, uh, because of history. Uh, a, and we have a relatively small list of those, although uh, very, it, it's become a little bit of a, uh, um, uh, an opportunity to add group after group, veteran status, marriage status, et cetera. But I, on, on things like ethnicity, race, and gender, the history of discrimination is such that we just say, don't use them. Uh, beyond that, there are any number of things that correlate very strongly with all of those things. Uh, and we have been quite slow to say, oh, you can't use anything that correlates with those. Uh, uh, there, there has to be some history and usually some sense that the 
uh, the correlating item is being used deliberately by lenders, say, uh, redlining neighborhoods because they're black uh, and they don't want to lend to blacks. So it's easy to say, uh, I don't want to lend to anybody in that neighborhood. Uh, uh, if you try to take that approach and generalize it to say, we won't allow anything that can later be shown to correlate to a particular characteristic and say, you can never use any of those, you are imposing quotas on every decision that falls within AI's um, purview. And this is one of the real hard problems is because AI is so easy to misuse and find these uh, hidden co-founding variables. Um, I have a quip. Uh, machine learning is a great way to teach a computer to be a racist asshole. And my worry is that some people like it that way. Um, you're talking about discovering uh, variables that you might not otherwise discover. Let me throw a couple of, of examples at you and ask you what you think. Um, say we have a model uh, for you know bail determination or parole, um, and it finds um, that being male is, uh, makes you more likely to be a repeat offender. Um, and thus it improves its performance, minimizes its error by taking gender into account. So you have, it's definitely judging people by their gender to some degree. Is that okay? That is the, uh, $64,000 question. Um, and this is also where explainability is absolutely essential if we want this for real world decision making is because if you can say the AI is making this decision because X, then you can go, is that actually a fundamental decision? Um, is it the right decision? And that's um, very, very important. And until we get explainability, um, that's my worry is that we can be baking in these biases from the data, from this curation of the data, from signals that you don't even realize are in the data. Um, and unless, you, and so we're, we're stuck with looking at outcomes. Um, so uh, I, yeah, let me, um, pick up on, on one aspect of that, which is uh, uh, ProPublica, I'm sure, found that that was exactly the case, that uh, uh, women are less likely to be recidivists, and the uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, did uh, uh, predict uh, fewer women would be recidivists, uh, um, and they didn't make much of it. And I think that's partly the misanthropomorphism that I talked about. They uh, they said, well, if they're discriminating in favor of women, they can't be sexist. Uh, so I guess it's not um, sexism. Um, and it's partly very practical. I think if you if you shim the data so that uh, uh, groups that have traditionally been discriminated against do better. I, nobody's going to complain. It's going to sound like fairness, or very few people are going to complain until they're disadvantaged by it. Um, if you shim the data to make it harder for women to get bail, uh, you're going to get a sex discrimination lawsuit because you also, deliberately but, introduced uh, a factor uh, that's not justified by the data to equalize the results. And I, I, I suspect that people don't do that because they have a sense of who's supposed to be protected by civil rights laws and it doesn't include the majority. I think it's more subtle than that. So the, the Boward County case, some of the flagship decisions are identical, nearly identical crime, vastly different criminal history. The white dude with the significantly worse criminal history given much lower bail than the black dude without the criminal history. This says that the machine learning was picking up on something outside what an explainable system would do. And that when you go back and do a much simpler machine learning model based on just recidivism rate based on cr prior criminal history, 
um, you actually get better results. Um, yeah, especially if you, if you throw in age, uh, it, uh, yeah. it turns out you, you don't need the AI at all. Yeah. And this is an example of where explanation defeats the AI. And the AI was making wrong decisions. And once you explain how, it, how you look at the decision making, you come up with a much simpler criteria that's not only much more effective, but eliminates all the biases outside that caused by the underlying policing. All right, I think another, another tough example was alluded to earlier. Um, uh, you know, when we said that Asian uh, facial recognition systems um, are typically better at recognizing Asian faces. And in, as a matter of fact, I'm aware of uh, uh, at least some studies that showed that uh, systems in um, East Asia uh, did worse at recognizing Caucasian faces than, than the faces of East Asians. And I guess you could say that's discrimination against Caucasians. Now, is that a problem or is it the right result given that this model is going to be used primarily on East Asian faces and you want to maximize overall error? It really I, I depends on context. So face recognition, truth be told, the bias in that doesn't bug me as much because what really bugs me is how it's actually being used. So why are the Chinese um, facial recognition program so much better at uh, Asian faces is they're basically trying to conduct mass surveillance in Xinjiang. Um, and so that would make them even better at Uyghur faces, huh? Yeah, and that's what they're optimizing for is their particular mission. Um, and um, face recognition seems to be a hot button on the AI field. Um, and it's not the one I worry about because um, you get the occasional false positives, um, but you go back and fix those compared with um, the problem of decision-making about people is a much bigger problem. I think the, 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 the East Asian facial recognition being be better on Asian faces example probably is an example of the the first order of bias correction that everyone should look for rather than saying oh another racist algorithm uh you might say uh how much training data in uh, with respect to particular groups does this algorithm have uh and Obviously, there's a lot more Asian faces available to do face recognition on uh, in China or uh, Korea or Japan than in the United States. Uh, and so you'd expect subtle differences to be picked up on more easily by uh, uh, algorithms that have had more training data. And so uh, before we jump to bias, we ought to ask, is this particular group that we think is suffering from bias simply too small, uh, uh, too underrepresented in the training data uh, for us to have confidence in the outcomes? Uh, and that's probably the case with a lot of the facial recognition problems. It's probably not perfect, uh, even if you did that, because there, there are going to be, uh, as I said, uh, questions about shadows that uh, don't show up on darker faces. But uh, I think the first thing we ought to ask is, is there a way to do more, to use more data to get better results? Or make the training data actually available for examination. Congratulations, Stuart, how do we do that? Regulation. Okay, I, I, I would rather that we were asking the question, how have we improved the accuracy, than how can we ignore accuracy and, and stick in a shim to achieve the social goal that we think is appropriate? And in order to understand that, you're going to need regulations that make training set data is available for examination and uh, explainability. Yeah, that, that may well be. Here's the other response to the problems of face recognition data, and it cuts against uh, uh, Nick's 
overall rule, which is you know, maybe you don't need the AI at all. Uh, uh, but with face recognition, maybe it's because humans are generally pretty good at it. The answer in most cases to, is to say, use it to narrow your suspects, but don't arrest people on the basis of the machine told me to. Uh, you, you ought to hold the police responsible for looking at two people and saying it's the same person, as opposed to say, I don't know, but the machine said it was. Agreed. And the other thing is, is you need um, to understand that when you're doing small recognition, which is what you're having the police do, um, your error rate um, is less of a problem. So if I'm comparing two photos and my error rate is 1%, I'm going to be right 99% of the time. Mm -hmm. If I'm comparing one photo against a database of 10 million and I have a 1% error rate, I'm going to be getting 10,000 errors for the one right answer. Right. But um, if you're a cop and you're looking through a list of suspects, you'd rather look at 10,000 than uh, a million. Right. And also what you do is you basically do take advantage of, uh, of separate errors and a different problem. And I agree that this is an example of what should be good AI regulation. Any arrest based on facial recognition must be confirmed by the officer before arrest. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. All right, let's take some uh, audience questions in these last uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, one, um, one caller asks, um, uh, you know, how do we know that there's not factors other than bias that are resulting in the disparate impact? And how would we uh, empirically test the hypothesis that it's uh, neutral rather than uh, discriminatory factors? So I think the first step, I, I would offer just the first step is you ought to ask, are there alternative hypotheses and can we test the alternative hypotheses. I, frankly, I, I understand that there's a body of thought in the country uh, that says, no, no, it's a racist country, uh, systemic racism. That's the first explanation and the easiest explanation. And you've got to rebut it uh, uh, before I'm going to listen to anything else. But I just don't think that's right. I think it's fair to, to, to start with the presumption that there may well be an alternative explanation and that it's at least as good as uh, uh, shouting systemic racism. Any thoughts, Nick? The thing is, is until you try for explainability, you're not going to be able to do this one way or the other. That, um, that the point of regulation that I think is necessary is to require at least some degree of explainability when you make a decision concerning a person, that we have uh, narrow areas where that happens and that keeps things a lot more honest. So like on uh, credit decisions, if you're denied credit, you get the right to the underlying data that was used to make the decision um, and can therefore look for errors and stuff like that. Um, if we're gonna think about how to deal with these problems, that I think is the best way to, to start going about it is, is regulation that allows or that mandates at least an attempt at explainability. Well, we actually have a question about um, explainability. Um, and it's, uh, you know, over time with, with greater uh, scientific sophistication, um, will the day come when explainability is no longer a problem? Um, you know, when AI can uh, easily explain itself. I would love this. This is a area that is a lot of focus of research. Um, and when, and I, for example, have colleagues that are in this and have discovered such things that it turns out that your neural networks are actually really crappy memories. Um, 
there actually isn't all that much true information that's being learned. Um, and uh, better explanations will really help mitigate a lot of these problems because it'll allow you to determine whether it's um, bias that was baked into the training set, bias that reflects the biases in our society, or just bad luck. Um, and being able to do that is a active area of research. And I really hope that progress is made because it really reduces the disruptive nature of this debate because there's no longer a, a debate of is the AI biased? It's just you ask it what it did. So I am I am reminded I, I'm I'm pretty sure this is uh, what was said by a researcher into human consciousness who said uh, uh, talking about all of the research that suggests that uh, uh, we do a lot of things before we decide to do them and then later uh, tell ourselves that we decided them uh, uh, that uh, uh, our consciousness is really just the PR agent for uh, the rest of our decision-making processes, which, which are substantially less elegant or attractive. Um, a, and, uh, uh, and so human explainability is probably not to be, sh shouldn't be our model, because I think you could easily discover a, and, and find a way to design an explainability algorithm that was as afraid of admitting to racism as the average American. Uh, and but would... the average American is a lot more capable of justifying their decision making. Yes, so, I think what's so what you, you could easily I'll be I'm, happy even with if with, uh, with, AI with explainability <laughs> is as good and as biased as you are, Stuart. I uh, fine. I, I I I do think you, you could you could end up with something that is basically casting about for alternative explanations and, and rolling them out until they've all been shot down and saying, oh, I guess I've got nothing else to explain it. Um, and maybe that's where we end up. Well, speaking of humans versus machines, um, this speaker says, uh, points out that uh, both speakers operate from the view that partially subjective uh, decisions should be automated so bureaucrats and judges can impose decisions without having to think about them. Uh, is that problematic? Um, I think that is problematic. And I don't mean to, to say I'm necessarily in favor of machinery decision making. That um, until the machinery decision making can explain what it's doing, you have real worries. Um, and I really don't like this trend towards AI automate the decision-making involving people, except in cases where you can show the work or you can involve a human in the loop so that the human is able to check the AI or vice versa. You have the AI check the humans. So, so uh, I, 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 I want to argue with the, uh, the question, the assumption of the question too. I'm not sure that any of us is, is saying, oh yeah, the best thing would be to get those humans out and just let the machines decide it. I think anybody who's been on the receiving end of algorithmic decisions knows that they suck and that one of the increasing luxuries that uh, money buys you and status buys you in this country is escaping algorithmic judgment and getting a human in its place. Uh, those of us who managed to skip the line or endure the line uh, so that we're no longer dealing with uh, uh, text messages from a machine know exactly what that's about. Uh, but putting a human in the loop just means we're going back to the old and flawed mechanism for making decisions. And we may not love that either. Let's wrap it up with um, a question I posed in the intro. Um, AI bias can potentially be addressed with the same anti-discrimination laws that govern human decision makers and, and the tools they use, such as hiring, hiring exams, are often the subject of, um, of discrimination litigation. So do we need new laws? Or maybe I'll put it another way. If, if I use hiring tools that result in discrimination, 
Uh, should it matter whether it's a dumb uh, employment test or a sophisticated AI tool? I'll say no. Should it matter? I think it's harder to say the the AI tool uh, was not related to the uh, job classification or the job qualifications because <clears throat> it is based on people who have succeeded in the uh, uh, in the job in the past. What else are you going to use uh, uh, to determine what qualifications are? Uh, the alternative is to say any tool that doesn't produce the kind of uh, uh, numbers that we demand is going to be struck down as discriminatory. I do think that's where we're going if we don't stop and think about what uh, uh, AI fairness actually means. Um, but uh, I don't think that's the place we want to end up. So um, do I hear you both saying that um, for now, we probably can deal with this through existing laws. That doesn't mean deal with it well, but that really these problems exist with or without AI. I'd say these problems exist with or without AI. It's just we should um, resist the AI defenders who use the algorithm as an excuse. Um, yeah, I worry that the fairness model, the, the, the use of fairness as a slogan, uh, which really means proportional representation in all things uh, governed by AI, is without some further action by legislators going to sweep a whole bunch of uh, uh, decisions into what amounts to a quota system. All right. Well, we'll have to wrap it up. I thought it was a very, very interesting panel. Thanks to two uh, great guests. So thank you, Stuart. And thank you, Nick. And uh, we're done for today. Thanks, Kurt. Thank, thank you. you. And on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank our audience for participating and sending in your questions. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned.